Hi, my name is Corporal Lucky Ho. Today, myself and Constable Sean Milne will be presenting to you um, fraud and cybercrime. We're going to talk to you how we can um, protect us, identify what, what fraud and cybercrime is, and how to protect yourself from it. So, as kids, we would tell kids not to talk to strangers. And to, it seems like the adults need to have the same lesson because they seem to talk to anybody that's out there on the internet. And we're going to go through the process of um, what fraud, cybercrime is, how to identify it, and how we can protect ourselves from it. So, like I said, it's going to be Stranger Danger for Adults is our presentation today. So today's topic, we're going to talk about social engineering, identity theft, different types of scams, and preventions. So in social engineering, what is that? Social engineering is basically people hacking. Because people, we as people, are the weakest link in any of the hacking scheme. Um, you know, a password can be hacked by a computer, supercomputer, but it might take a lot of time to do it. But if you were to figure out a person, you can probably figure out the, that person's password a lot faster than a computer can. So I got a video here to show you uh, what social engineering looked like. Um, it's basically a, a hacking convention. This lady will uh, do a phishing, not a phishing call, but she'll do a call um, and try to get some of the information. And the video is a perfect illustration of what social engineering is. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, At gmail .com. Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. So the video perfectly illustrate what um, can happen in a social engineering hack. Um, so in that video, it plays on a person's emotion. Um, so it's, what is social engineering? It's basically psychologically manipulating people into doing what you want to do or leaking sensitive information. It involves smooth talking with no technical knowledge required. Um, criminal use it to commit fraud. Um, state actor use it to steal industrial or military secret and or disrupt uh, infrastructure. Why is it so successful? It basically exploits our basic human nature. Um, as human, we tend to trust others. 
we de our desire to help others, um, our guilt from making others feel bad, desire to be cooperative, and we fear that saying no may have consequences. So as that video showed, um, with very little information, she was able to acquire a lot of information, be able to take over a phone account by basically playing on those um, emotion of, and human nature characteristics. So what, what kind of information are they after? Well, they want to they hack us because they want to obtain our information so they can take over our account, our information, so they can um, use it against us. So some of the information that they go after on a computer, our username, password, security question, example would be mother maiden name. So a lot of you I know use mother maiden name as a secondary password. If that information is out there, very easily accessible to um, people that want to compromise your identity. Um, other thing they want to compromise, account numbers, ID cards, numbers, like your social insurance number, driver license, your employment duties. If you work in a sensitive area, um, like even for myself, I have to be careful working with the RCMP. If somebody knows what I do day to day duty, they may want to approach me to get information that I may not want to be disclosing. So how it works? Typical goals, most criminals just want to steal the victim identity or money. It's quick and dirty, they build trust quickly, they get the money and move on. On a bigger level, on a state actor level, they want to compromise the employer via the employee. So something like that is if you, got, you work for a company that has some good technical know-how secret, they're going to not go after the company because that's, that's a lot of level of security to get through. But a person, if they can get to a person that works in that secret, uh, work in a sensitive area, it's easier to hack that person. Um, so what they do, they create long-term relationship, and they do this so they can remain undetected to prolong the access to the secrets. Uh, usually this is a phase approach. Um, they gather intelligence about the victim or the employee. And how do they do this? Social media is one of the easy ways to gather information about a lot of people. Um, as an investigator, what I, first thing I do to look up somebody I want to investigate, I see if I they have information on social media. And the bad guys does the same thing, right? So they choose the best compromise. Once they learn about you and how you operate, how you do your day-to-day -day things, they choose the best uh, compromise tactic to compromise you. And this could mean um, baiting, malware uh, attack, phishing, spear phishing, and Sean will get into some of those. Um, so, so, uh, Shoulder surfing is basically if you're at a park working on something on an airplane, somebody can just looking over your shoulder and see what you're doing. That's one way to explain to exploit some information. Um, and then they exploit the trust that they gain from you to, to gain information. So some defenses against social engineering attack, don't open emails, attachment from unknown or regular contacts. You know, these can contain malware like key loggers. Limit your personal contact information published on an unofficial unit or personal websites. Again, don't put your information out there for everybody to see. Um, I know a lot of people like to put out there they're going on vacation, um, what they do, their day-to-day -day lives. Again, you don't know who's looking at that stuff. And if you're working or you're in a sensitive area, that's one way hackers or People that want to scam you can use that information against you. Be careful about your online community, community participation and what information opinion you share. Again, these days and age, um, what you put out there stays out there. And a lot can be learned about an individual by looking at the social media profile. And one example, uh, army.ca forum is a popular online community. And if somebody wants to attack the government, the, the military, um, they can go about doing this. If you're posting stuff on there that identify who you are, what unit you're working with, again, 
this is one way they can um, attack it. Assume what you post online will be there forever. So when you delete, it doesn't mean it be deleted. It can be screen capture and saved somewhere. So one of the way to def defense against social engineering is locking down your social media account. You know, search yourself on Google. See what information is out there about you. Because um, you may be leaking personal information you don't even know. So one thing you might want to do, put your name, um, or one search I do is put my name and the city I'm in. And what it does is search anything about me, um, see what is out there, and you'd be surprised what's out there about you. And regularly check your, regularly check your social media profile privacy settings. Make sure you know who can look at your account. Only share, share what you want to share to people you want to share with, and not for the whole world to see. Um, one of the Yushi uh, sites like Facebook, um, they change your, so your privacy setting regularly without you knowing. So if you don't go in and change those settings, um, you'd be surprised of what information is left out there for the world to see. So yeah, so basically lock down your social media account, check what you are leaking out there for information so that people don't use that information ag ag against you, to use that to scam you. So Sean's going to talk about how they can use this information about you. Hi, my name is Constable Sean Milney, and as Lucky said, I'm going to talk to you about identity theft. Identity theft occurs in a number of ways. While the focus of this presentation is online, we'll talk about some of the older ways first. One of the older ways is theft of personal documents. This is just the typical stealing your wallet, stealing your mail. If you leave your wallet or other identification in your car or otherwise accessible places and people steal it, your identity information can be taken that way. Redirection of mail is a way they can do it by setting up so Canada Post will send mail it's addressed to you to a new mailbox that they control. Keep an eye out for your mail and if things ever stop appearing that you're expecting, look into that. It could be theft of your identity information. And the oldest one in the book, dumpster diving. People still do it and people still throw out information that they haven't taken the steps to protect. If you're throwing out identity information without shredding it first, somebody may take it. It's a full-time job for some. There's also ways you can't necessarily control entirely, like theft of your information from third parties. If you've ever signed up for a consumer rewards program or otherwise given your information to a company or other agency that takes it in for their own databases, that does render you vulnerable if that agency gets hacked. The, the most you can do to protect yourself in this case is just limit the kind of information you give out there and the things you sign up for. Because every time you do, it opens up a vulnerability that if that company gets hacked, now your information is part of the data breach. The, digital, the first digital means we're going to use, talk about in stealing your identity information is what's called phishing. Phishing uses the social engineering techniques Lucky talked about in emails, text messages, or social media to try to get you to provide personal information to the scammer or click a link that takes you to a website controlled by the scammer. They will use a variety of themes in these phishing emails. There will be the basic kind of administrative issue where it's something that's so blasé you don't really think twice about it because it seems so routine. So they'll send a message saying, there's a problem with your email box. Maybe it's nearing its capacity. There's a problem with your Netflix account and that the payment method on file no longer works. And so you log into your email or log into your Netflix by clicking the link that they provided in the email. But you're not logging into your real email or your real Netflix. You're logging into a clone website that they control. And in doing so, they're going to take your identity information, your login information, and use it against you later. Another theme of the phishing emails that they use is a problem fish. This is an issue with your bank or government account or some other agency that you need to address right away. If you don't address it right away, there could be a problem with your money or something else important. And because they create that bit of fear in you, you may overlook warning signs that this is an email that shouldn't be trusted. Anytime you receive a communication that you're not expecting and it's creating a problem that you need to address, this is something that needs to be examined extra closely to make sure it's legitimate. Taking it a step further, they may even go with a danger fish. In this case, they create a situation that is imminent. They may even say there's a situation ongoing somewhere live near you that you have to look at right away. One, theme, one way that they do this is sending an email purporting to be from police. 
and they'll say that there's instructions that you need to follow in the link that they provide or the email attachment they send. The link will once again take you to a website they control and the attachment they provide may install malware on your computer. Anytime that there's something that's a dangerous situation going on, A, it probably won't come by email, but if it does, be extra cautious and don't let fear override your skepticism. Another theme of the phishing they use is the free money fish. In this case, you may have a tax return that you weren't expecting that you need to log into your Canada Revenue Agency to claim. Or the bank may have money that for you that you need to log into your bank account to claim. In each case, that link you follow won't take you to the actual Canada Revenue Agency or your actual bank. It'll take you to a website they use to harvest your login credentials. Don't be fooled by free money in your email. Be skeptical and treat it with caution. If you run a business, you have some other types of phishing you have to watch out for. As Lucky said earlier, people want to avoid trouble, avoid causing problems. So if you get an email from a very angry client who's very dissatisfied with your service and insists that you look at the attachment they sent to your email, is that an actual angry client? Or is it someone relying on the customer service in instincts of your representative to say, oh no, there's a problem that needs to be addressed, and they open that attachment without thinking. Be careful. Anger, fear, they all get people to open attachments and they will use that against you. Going the other way, how do you hire people? How do you solicit resumes? If you've posted a job advertisement online saying, email resumes to our address, that's something the scammer can easily find and they can easily send you a resume to your email. Opening that attachment though, once again, leaves you open having malware installed on your system. So be cautious what kind of information you solicit people to send you and how they send it to you as that can be exploited as well. These themes all go over to text messages too. Text messages from the bank saying there's a problem with your account once again that you need to look into and click on the link in the text. Ones from the post office saying that your parcel has arrived but there's an issue of tax that needs to be paid. Please log into the account to see the issue. Any unsolicited text messages, the same as unsolicited emails, need to be treated with skepticism. If all else fails, and you actually are concerned that this is something legitimate, contact the institution that claims to be sending you this message through other means. Don't use the one they sent you in the message, but research a contact yourself and talk to them directly and see if this is something that's legitimate or not. Some things to look out for these messages that help identify as to whether it's a scam or not is first off, look at where the message came from. And does the address that it says actually match up with what you'd expect from that institution? Would your bank be emailing you from an address that looks like a random combination of letters and numbers? Or would they send you a text message from something like that? Probably not. If they get a little more sophisticated, they may use a domain that looks similar to what your bank or other institution would use, but isn't actually the one that the bank uses. For example, at the RCMP, you may get an email from someone at rcmp.ca. That would look legitimate, but that's not how our actual email works. Our emails are from RCMP dash grc dot gc dot ca but that's not common knowledge so you need to be cautious as to what those domain names look like another thing they can do is just subtly alter the legitimate domain name by changing one letter so that when you glaze over when you read over it really quickly you don't even notice it an o becomes a zero or an m becomes an n and suddenly you're sending emails back to someone that you think is that legitimate but it isn't just from the change of one letter or number in that email address as always, look for poor grammar and spelling mistakes. Many of these scams originate from overseas, and so often English may not be their first language, and you may be able to detect that in how the message is written. As always, look out for urgency or scare tactics. They will use the social engineering techniques described to try to overwhelm your caution and make you act before you think. Watch out for impersonal messages. These people may be contacting a lot of different potential victims all in one message, and so if it's just addressed to generally to your customer, that may be an indication that they're looking for you as well as other people with that message. And the most important one to watch out for is if they ask you to open a link or open an attachment. Clicking the link takes you to a website they control. Opening an attachment may install malware on your computer. Be extra cautious if either of these is implicated in the message you receive. Now I'm going to talk to you about some of the scams that are out there that you may fall victim to and how to watch out for them. Talking for computer scams, the first one we know of to talk about is support scams. In this case, often because malware has already made its way onto your computer, 
your device may have a pop-up show up that say, oh no, your computer has an issue that needs to be addressed. But fortunately, the company, like Microsoft, has already taken steps to identify it, and all you do need to do is phone them to get it fixed. Unfortunately, these companies aren't that proactive in addressing these computer problems, and that's just a scam. And the phone number you call will put you in touch with a technician who is there to take your money or your information. Anytime a pop-up like that happens and it offers you a ready-made means to contact the company and get it fixed, that's a problem. You should take it to a professional you know and trust to get that looked into. A variant of this scam, where something pops up on your computer, is what's known as scareware. In this case, the message that pops up will implicate you in a crime, offense, or some other salacious detail that you would rather not have on public. Of course, there's an easy way they offer for you to fix this. You can pay your fine online, often through a cryptocurrency. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, that's not how the law works or how the institutions enforce the law work. You can't pay your fine online, you can't pay it with Bitcoin. Anytime that kind of thing pops up your device, it should be treated with suspicion and that device should be cleaned by professional you trust. Another variant is what's known as ransomware. In this case, a message will pop up saying that your system has been locked and your files have been encrypted. And unless you send money to the scammer, they will be deleted in a certain period of time. When this happens, the threat is not idle. The malware is already on your system and they have locked your, locked your files and they will be deleted if it's something isn't done. The problem is there's no guarantee that they will do anything if you do send money. So if this kind of thing appears on your computer, it's best to reach out to professional help before acting upon it, as otherwise you may lose money and your files in the process. Related to these scams are what's known as extortion emails. Messages received where the scammer will claim to have something incriminating or dirty on you, and that unless you act, they're gonna send that to everyone on your contact list. To make it look extra legitimate, often these will claim to know your email password. Sometimes they actually guess the password right. Usually this is a sign that you haven't changed your email password in a long time, and they've got some old information that they're hoping is actually accurate. These emails are not to be trusted. Don't send any money because they don't actually have much on you to act on. All these techniques also translate into phone scams. They will call you claiming to be Canada Revenue Agency, Service Canada, Immigration, Police, your bank or your credit card company, charities, lottery, any number of co companies or agencies that have an interest in getting your identity information or your money. Unsolicited phone calls should be treated with the same suspicion as unsolicited emails, text messages and social media contacts. Be cautious with what you provide and when if all else fails, hang up and call them back through a number that you identify on your own, not one they provide. As with the phishing attempts on email or text message, their goals are still the same. To get your personal information, to get your financial information, or to get you to send money. Hang up. That's the easiest way to deal with these things. The trick is a scammer won't want you to hang up. By threats, coercion, or generally trying to sweet talk you, they'll try to keep you on the line. A real person calling from a bank, CRA, or the police will understand that these scams are common and will encourage you to be suspicious and verify that they are who they actually say they are. When you do this, don't call back any number that they provide you. Verify it yourself. Find it on Google yourself. Look at the back of your credit card. Anything else you can get a phone number other than the one they provide. So going into the other types of scams that people encounter. The first one I want to talk about is emergency scams, often known as the grandparent scam because it targets older people. In this case, you'll be contacted by a scammer claiming that there's some sort of family emergency and that the caller is away from home or maybe they're overseas. They need you to keep it secret because it's embarrassing to them and they don't want the rest of the family to know, but it needs to happen right now, possibly because they're in jail or at risk of going to jail. They'll ask you to send money by e-transfer or Western Union or MoneyGram. These should all be treated with suspicion because they have the exact same social engineering techniques that Lucky already talked about. Urgency, scare tactics, need to send money right now. Hang up, double check with other family, double check with the person who they claim to be directly. Romance scams. It's a lonely world out there and in the current day and age, finding love online is not uncommon. Of course, scammers know this too and so they will create fake profiles on these online portals, eHarmony, Tinder, whatever you can think of, to lure people in. Once they've made contact with somebody, they'll spin a story about how they're often overseas or somewhere distant from the person that they're trying to victimize. They can't meet, 
or won't be able to meet yet, but they need help. Often it will start small, they'll ask for an iTunes card, because they can't access an Apple store near them, or to send them a phone because their phone broke. And as this carries on, they'll escalate, asking for more and more to actually send money. They'll also always urge the victim to keep it secret. Don't tell the family just quite yet. They say this because they don't want the family to poke holes in what they're saying to you. So how do you address these possible romance scams? Don't keep it secret. If you're in a relationship, tell people about it. And if it seems suspicious, other people will pick up on that. Don't send money or handle money to a person you've never met. If you don't have money, they may get you to move money on their behalf, making you, in effect, a money launderer for them. Don't provide an address or handle packages. They may not get you to move money, but they may get you to move merchandise. And when you're dealing with these kinds of relationships, don't send explicit pictures or videos to someone you've never met. That will give them the opportunity to extort you by threatening to release those pictures to your contact lists or to the internet in general. Another type of scam that's common out there is what's known as the investment scam. In this case, unsolicited opportunities for you to make money that you couldn't possibly make through conventional means. They'll always have some sort of inside angle where they have a special technique that they can give to you that will get you extra money with high return and very low risk. There will be a contract or legal agreement, or if there is a contract or legal agreement, it'll be a bogus one. It'll be overseas investment opportunities that you need to invest in, or strictly online. There won't be an actual business you can go to to check this out. Of course, it'll always be a limited time offer because social engineering requires an urgency to overcome people's suspicion. So if you don't act now, you will lose that chance. Anytime you are looking at doing an investment, do your due diligence and do your research. The Alberta Securities Commission runs checkfirst.ca, which is an excellent first step to do that research to determine if your money will be safe where you're putting it. Another type of scam is what's called the merchandise scam or the Kijiji scam. In this case, they're selling something online, be it a car, a puppy, an instrument, anything they can think of selling. Usually the price will be very attractive, but what they'll want first is a deposit on the item because there's a lot of interest and they need to be sure you're a legitimate customer before they hold it. So you send that deposit and after that they cut off all contact with you having got the money they're looking for or they try to get extra money before you, they actually deliver the merchandise. In each case, there's no actual merchandise to be delivered, and they're just trying to get as much money out of you as they can. So beware of overseas buyers and sellers. Someone from Texas isn't interested in buying your tires, and you gotta be careful when you're looking at buying a puppy from Kansas. Look for limited or no feedback on the seller. These accounts get shut down regularly, and so they have to create new ones. And so if the account you're dealing with is young, there's very little feedback, that's a reason to be concerned and never send a deposit for something unless you're 100% sure that the seller is legitimate. Another scam to be cautious for is the job scam. These come in a few variants. There's mystery shoppers, where they will give you a check or some sort of other payment method that you need to take and cash in and then send some of that money back to them. While the check you received or payment that you received is counterfeit, the money you take out is legitimate and the money you send them is legitimate, but when everything falls apart, it's you left holding the bag on that bogus check that you initially received. Another job scam is as a payment processor or debt collector for a company that claims to be overseas. They'll say they need someone to process their Canadian clients to take money in and then send the money to them and usually keep a cut of it. In this case, this is you being a money launderer on their behalf as other victims they've hooked are sending you their money and you're sending it to the bad guy in return. Another one similar to that is reshipping where they convince people to buy merchandise, have it shipped to your address, and then you ship it to the bad guy. In all these cases, the thing to ask is, would you trust someone that you'd never met in person to handle your money? Well, neither would a legitimate company. If you've never done a face-to-face -face interview or actually met the person who you're gonna be handling all these sums for, that's a reason to be concerned. Another common scam is what's called advanced fee scams or sending money to get money. In this case, the scammer will claim you've won the lottery or that you can apply for a loan or grant. In this case, as part of the application process, you need to send money to them before you get the money from them. It'll be as a, either a security or to pay for insurance or any other thing they can think of. But the fact is, it's illegal to require a person to send money before they get money, no matter what the circumstances. So if that kind of situation comes up, it's a reason to be concerned and be suspicious.
Here are a few red lights to be cautious of that you should always be suspicious of and always consider this to be a part of fraud. If they are wanting to use play cards instead of money, if they're asking you to buy Google cards or iTunes cards or Steam cards to move money for them, that's a problem. You can't pay your taxes with iTunes cards and people shouldn't be calling you over the phone instructing you to buy Google Play cards. Anytime those kinds of cards come up in a transaction, that's a reason to be suspicious. A second red light is cryptocurrency, often known as Bitcoin. Bitcoin can have some legitimate uses, but it's a complicated thing to understand. And scammers will take advantage of that, that people don't understand it, but will think that it works like real money. If you don't know how Bitcoin works, don't deal with Bitcoin and don't let someone else convince you to deal with Bitcoin. That's a red flag for scams. A third red flag is checks. It is really easy to make bogus checks and send them to people and get them to cash them in. If at any point you're dealing with someone you've never met in person or you're not sure about and a check comes into play, that's a red flag for scams. Don't act on that check, don't negotiate that check, and certainly don't send money to anyone after you cash that check. Okay, so Sean just went through all the different way that the scammer can target and scam you in different tactics. So how do we prevent this? So I'm gonna go through talking about basic prevention. Basically, don't be complacent. Fraud is an international organized and big business. And they can find and will find you or a small company or big company. Basically, be suspicious with any money and information you put out there. Slow down, right? Don't be pressure and say no. You know, take the time, check, check it out, do your research. Um, one of the example, um, one of the common scams that goes out is called business email uh, compromise. What happened is they, uh, a scammer can target a company, uses, learn about that company by, you know, company usually lists who their CEO, CFO, important people are. They take an email, change a little bit of it, send it to uh, somebody in the company saying, uh, I'm traveling. They find out the person is traveling overseas. Um, they send a, this email to a secretary, somebody in the company saying, I'm traveling, I need this money sent to me ASAP for a business deal and without checking and I can't be reached by phone. That should be a, a red flag. If it's something important, take the time, pick up that phone, make the phone call. Uh, a lot of times these business or these people are afraid to lose the job or not following the boss instruction and don't do it by the email. Um, so they do what the, the scammer is telling them to do in the email. And then at the end of the day, they realize the email is not actually coming from the boss, but from um, a scammer. So take the time, check it out, do your research, pick up the phone. I'm just going to play um, a video on, it's a news story on a Hamas dating app. It's basically how, um, an organization like Hamas can be targeting Israeli soldiers by putting apps out there for them to download and then basically do a takeover of their phone for information. Hamas is sweetening its honey traps. Online dating and soccer apps are some of the tools being used by the militant organization to try and collect sensitive information from the cell phones of Israeli soldiers. The method is simple enough. Hamas operatives would disguise themselves online by using fake or stolen social media accounts on platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp while using Israeli telephone numbers. The operatives, using decent Hebrew, would try to strike up intimate conversations with IDF soldiers. Apps like Glancelove or a similar one called Wink Chat may appear innocent enough, but the IDF says they actually allow their Hamas developers to take control of whatever phone they're installed on, with full access to all files and contacts, as well as access to the phone's camera and microphone. These dating apps used to be available for download from Google Play Store, but were recently removed. Another app called Golden Cup was able to offer highlights of goals from the World Cup tournament currently underway in Russia. But like the supposed dating software, 
The real purpose was to turn phones into intelligence collecting devices. הדיווחים הגיעו בין החודשים ינואר למרץ, ובחודש מרץ הגענו למסקנה חד משמעית שמדובר בתשתית תקיפה בסייבר חדשה של חמאס, שפועלת למול משרתי צה"ל על מנת לאסוף מידע ממכשירם הסלולרי ולפגוע בביטחון המידע. The three apps have been downloaded some 400 times by soldiers since January, but the IDF stresses it is not aware of any security breach caused as a result, even calling the effort a failure. When pressed as to how they could know exactly who has installed the software and what has been collected already, IDF officers told reporters Tuesday that the Army has its own cyber operatives, suggesting they are able to obtain such information. The officers refuse to say how the IDF knows Hamas stands behind the project. while also declining to comment on whether the apps could be exploited by the IDF for counterintelligence. Shai Ben-Ari, I-24 News. Okay, so as you can see in that video, by downloading apps or information or apps or things that you don't understand or know that you're not trusted, even though it's on Google Play Store or iTunes Store, anybody can put, could publish software on the iTunes Store. But if you don't know who's behind it and what um, what that app can, can do on your phone, um, you, are, you can be providing a lot of information that, that you don't want out there. For example, your phone or Wi-Fi devices can always track your location. Um, so by giving access to these unknown apps to your phone, um, you're providing basically them everything about your phone. Just another one is fitness apps. Um, like I have uh, Strava on my phone. If you don't lock down your Strava account, people that follows you can know where your running routes are, know where you live, basically looking at your Strava account because you usually start the run from the same location every day. They can find all your habits. Other general safe practice. Like I said, for never use a public computer to log into any personal account because you don't know where, who has access to a computer before. Basically, they can put data logger, key logger on those computer at the beginning of the day. I know a lot of hotels and stuff, they wipe the computer every day, but it all it takes is somebody before you go in, put this stuff on, you use it, they come in after you. Now they have all your information, all your login, your bank, your G email accounts. Um, I think don't, don't insert USB, SD cards, or, or anything into a public computer. Again, you don't know what those computers have been infected with, with malware. So if you put your USB in there, use it, bring it home or a work device, stick it in your work device, now you've infected your, your work network or your home computer. And the other thing is, don't insert any unknown USB or any other devices, unknown devices into your personal work computer. If I was a bad guy, I, I want to access, let's say, um, the RCMP uh, network. You know, human are curious, by, have curiosity by nature. So, you know, like a lot of times, you might find a USB stick on the ground outside the door of your office. or outside just on the parking lot, you might say, oh, I wonder who this is. You know, you bring it back in, stick in your computer just to find out what information is on there, can maybe just to return to the rightful owner. Or in an SD card, you might want to see what picture's on there to return to the rightful owner. You put that in your computer, you don't know what's in there, and it can be infected malware, and now your network's compromised. Uh, don't do any personal banking or anything sensitive over public Wi-Fi. because you don't know who has control of that public Wi-Fi space. A lot of time a Wi-Fi um, can be spoof. So let's say Starbucks Wi-Fi hotspot. I can create a Starbucks Wi-Fi hotspot sitting in the, in the Starbucks. And as, as, a, as a hacker, you can log into my wi Starbucks account, not the proper Starbucks uh, Wi-Fi, thinking your traffic is going to a safe place, it's not. I'm intercepting all that traffic. So now I have all your information. So one way to prevent this is use a VPN service, a virtual private network. Um, so you can pay for these service. Again, it's not a 100% way to secure, but again, it, it anonymizes your, 
traffic so that it's better than nothing. So how two-factor authentication work is, is when some, a new device or an unknown device is logging to an account that you have set up two-factor on, it should be sending a text to another device, like a phone or another email account, saying, hey, do you really want to log into this account? And if you do, here's the access code. So by doing that, it prevents a lot of hack because they now they need access to two of your accounts to be able to, to, um, to access the one account. So if you own a big business uh, or business that has something that people want, serious, serious time and effort can be dedicated to finding out all about the, your, your business and your processes, right? So a lot of information value, like I said before, can be found through social media, right? E and easy, and even on online job advertising. Um, just an IT company, if they put on knowledge, as a company, you put on knowledge of Microsoft uh, NT server. Now a hacker knows that your company runs Microsoft NT as a server. So now they have a way to, exp they know what you're running to exploit that. Um, a lot of time, employee, they list all the employee email address on their website. Um, again, now they, a lot of websites or a lot of authentication uses an email address. Now they have half the puzzle to do this. So now they've got to figure out the other half. And a lot of time when places are compromised, they put the stuff out on the dark web to be sell, to be sold. Um, you can go on to a place, a website called Have I Been Pwned? If you put in your email account or any account, it will actually tell you if that your email has been compromised and been sold on the dark web. If you put a lot of information out there about your company, again, if you have a company, yeah, you want people to know, if you, but, but you have a location where you, if you're putting um, where your servers are, um, physical interception can be deployed. W what that means is I can have somebody, you know, be a bad actor, hang out at that, at that location where um, I know you're, where you're going to be and start doing a social engineering tactic to learn about, to know about you, get to know who you are, or even just somebody going through the door, I can follow somebody in. And one last part, they can probe the internet on your servers. They can, the hacker, they can probe the, uh, the server to see what other exploit can come through that way. But again, that's in rare cases. Um, but most of the attack are social engineering attack because people are the weakest link. So like I said, the best way to gain network access is new social engineering techniques because people, we make a password easy to guess. We don't, we do as simple as possible. We don't do the hard password. Um, you know, with 12 or more digits because we won't be able to remember these passwords ourselves. Um, and the other way they can ac gain access, they can identify a vulnerable employee. It's an insider threat, right? They look at um, people that are, you know, they look at people that have access to grind with the company. Um, again, these are high level, um, usually targets you probably won't see, but just to know they exist. So some mitigation strategy, again, limit what information you share on social media about your job and your employer, about your company. Use generic contact email address. Instead of providing specific employee address for job ad, media release, use a, a generic one, like resume at your company, wherever. So it's not, so it doesn't have the person's name. Um, do, n do not reuse password and make them strong. Again, that's obvious. Be less Canadian and don't hold employee entrance door open. Like basically it's saying, don't be polite, don't be nice, right? You see somebody coming, you don't know who they are, challenge them, right? Don't just let somebody walk through the front door. And this goes the same with uh, on the phone, if a hacker or scammer calling you, if you think you're being scammed, don't be polite, hang up. This is for more high level stuff. Check your workstation at the start of shift. Practice, is there something connected that wasn't there before? You know, a lot of time there might be a USB device that's on there that 
you don't recognize, okay, that could be a red flag. Um, disable your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi auto connect because when you're on Bluetooth or Wi-Fi connect, those, um, the network is actually obtaining information about your devices. Um, annual phishing exercise, this is for corporation, you know, they can mitigate threat by uh, running exercises by sending out their own phishing email, see which employer, which, who would be uh, gullible enough to, to click on these links and then do education for your employee, right? Again, um, the weakest link is the person. As long as you educate, teach, you know, this is where you can mitigate your, your, your losses. Like you said, basic prevention is about education and that's why we're here. We're trying to educate you provide information so that you're aware of all the things that can go on. Um, so when you have this knowledge, knowledge is power. If all this hasn't helped you and you, are bec you do become a victim, seek help, uh, report it, right? Contact your local, local law enforcement agency. And by doing this, you protect yourself and others because if the police aren't aware of the scam or we, won't, we aren't able to investigate it. If we can investigate, there may be other like you. So report to your local police and another good resource, the Anti-Fraud Center. So hopefully all that information has been helpful for you in keeping an eye out for scams out there in the world and protecting your identity information. One thing we do encourage is take this information and share it with others. Remember, a lot of these scams rely on people keeping it secret. So if you see someone near you, like friends or family that you think might be involved, ask them what's going on. Tell them some of the information you've learned and see what they're involved with. It never hurts to call police. We're happier to prevent a crime than we are to try to solve one. And remember, the basic theme of it all, stranger danger, just like it was when you were kids.